Okay, so I announced the bingo. Is it a crime? Eddie, what do you want to do? You've asked me that question for a year. But you haven't answered for a year. I want to write the Maltese Falcon, I want to record Blue Suede Shoes, and I want to play Las Vegas. They've done the first two. That's the rumor. Eddie. What? Do you know what? What? You're a bloody nut. I owe it all to you, Doc. What's this? I'm advertising. How long have I been lying here, though? A week? Can't think. Mum called me Barmy when I told her I fell off a gasometer for the bet. But I'm not Barmy. I'm a fighting pit prop that wants a pint of beer, that's me. But if an annoying bastard says that's me, I'll tell him I'm a dynamite dealer waiting to blow the factory to kingdom come. I'm me and nobody else. Whatever people say I am, that's what I'm not. Because they don't know a bloody thing about me. Hi, and uh, welcome to Ward 13. Ward 13 goes to the movies. Uh, we have a special request tonight, uh, and Jim is going to read one of the great poems of the 20th century. From a fellow countryman of mine. Yes. No other than William Butler Yeats. So uh, this is the second coming, and uh, John has asked me to re read it because of my Irish tone, I guess. So, and it's an honor? Is it an honor of somebody? You're yes, so but okay. we, we're not going to mention Oh, we're not? Okay. We don't right. want to humiliate anybody by not associating anybody. with Ward okay. 13 so, other than you, Jim. Okay, so this... <laughs> yeah, I'll be humiliated enough. So The Second Coming by William Bartler, Bartler Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Some surely revelation. Sh sorry, surely some You'll revelation get it the second is time. second time. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow th ties, while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Well, after your, if anybody's uh, still watching from your show, can you pass that over? I can. Because you're going to read it again at, at the end. Uh, right. After the, uh, the run through. W.B. Yeats. I think that, uh, well, every every generation, you know, this was during the Irish Civil War, I right. think, after, yeah. yeah. 
I, I love his line, uh, you know, uh, uh, all, uh, all is changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That's what he talked about at the dawn of Irish independence. Yes. But, of course, the mo probably the most famous part, other than, the, you know, to say what the most famous part of this poem is, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. Yeah, Some things right. never change. Huh? Yeah, I, well, this is the beauty of poetry, right? Especially poetry written, written by someone like W.B. Yeats. Genius. I mean, you can read these poems and read them again and again, and there's meaning within meaning. You know, people teach courses on the thing, right? You know, yeah. on, on individual poems. You know, and uh, it's uh, it's wonderful stuff. I have I have uh, I have a, a lot of books at home, but I have a collection of uh, poetry, and some of it is used more often than others. Other parts are, but I have a um, I have a compendium of the works of W. B. Yeats, and uh, that's pretty dog-eared. And, Yours, and, yes, I and, have mine. Yeah, and as much as I, you know, I go back to it, and I wish I could, I wish I could, um, I love, I can remember individual lines, you know, the be loud glade and all, like, but um, I, uh, the, the Ballad of Wandering Angus. How can you tell the dancer from the dance? Uh, that's from Among School Children. Among School, yeah. I used to know, I used to be able to recite well, parts of it. Now it comes down to like one line or a fragment. There was a time a when, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid in school in Ireland, we used to have to learn off 10 lines of poetry every single night. Learn it off. And, uh, and uh, this was probably in uh, half, like halfway through high school, like that kind of time, like 14 or 15. You had to learn 10 lines of poetry and sometimes Shakespeare, whatever it happened to be. You had to learn 10 lines Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night and Thursday night. And then on Friday, you had to you had to be able to repeat all right. all all, all uh, forty lines. And sometimes it was a little more, sometimes a little less. But every morning when you came into school, the first thing you did in English class was you had to write the ten lines. And if you made more than three mistakes, you were sent out to the line <laughs> where, where where you got a cane. So because maybe, you were caned, yeah, all the time. We got Jesus. caned more and more days than we didn't get caned. Actually, the days we didn't get caned, we thought there was something wrong with us. That's a slight exaggeration. But honestly, this was a particularly intense uh, guy. But um, and, and a mistake... Is this the Christian Brothers School in Ireland, or are you in England? This was Presentation Brothers. They were like the provisional wing of the Christian Brothers. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but they, the Presentation, wonderful teachers, wonderful men, but they, you know, they were different times. But a mistake, in, it, was, it wasn't just knowing the words. You, 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 uh, if you had a spelling mistake, so three right. mistakes mistakes in the line so you had to have every one word i i sweat blood learning those things because you had to learn them also the punctuation had to be perfect if you put a comma instead of a semicolon that was a mistake well so, you're being you were being taught how to uh, everybody says about that type of classical education to think but it was really yet how to communicate and how to write because when you had all those models, my father uh, refused to take the college course back in like what, 1941 because what, what, why would I take the college course? I'm not going to college. So they had the commercial course. He had their, uh, and I have his school books in West High of the time, Racine, you know, all the French plays. Right. He had the no French, Latin really? for the commercial course. Wow. wow. But it's you know you learn how to communicate and how to talk. Right. Well, what, what I, do you, I don't know. Speak, you yeah, know, rhetoric, speak. how to yeah. use rhetoric. And then in, in elocution was a thing. We had to be able to enunciate properly. You know, you could get into trouble for that too. Well, that could but, help. And I don't know whether these things are good. And there are, some people are married to these old, the good old days, and that was when people really learned, which I, I call foul to all of that. It's mostly, however, I, I mean, I'm the product of it myself. The, it's advantages that you certainly end up with a body, if, if, if that's what you are into and are able to, to, and you able can, to manage it, you end up with this body of knowledge that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And but, you can use it. But you can communicate with a vast uh, group of people because yes. then you're learning French. You know, Pasternak, uh, who was fluent in English, trans right. translated Shakespeare. Well, and in, it's quite beautiful, right. Shakespeare. Uh, people in the early 20th century, for sure. You know, they people could like James Joyce, with each a, other. They were yeah. all multilingual, though. Oh, jeez, he was yeah. a genius, right. though. So, but Ital they, yes, they Italian, were, you know, French, French, Italian, you know, Everything. German. Yeah. They, they would use, and sort of the, the British aristocracy, you know, it was a thing, right? To sort of, you know, people, well, we the, Queen's, the Queen's husband was German, right? So it's like they, uh, they, they, uh, they were able to switch back and forth um, in languages. So you learn these languages. And then 
earlier time, of course, people re- learned Latin and Greek, and a lot of it came from the Latin. Everybody, do- everybody had to learn Latin. Sorry, to, when yeah, I was because in, you learn the Latin roots. Yes, then you know La- the key to language well, and well, Greek, but Greek. When I was in high, when, we when I was kids. in high school in I Ireland in the nineteen seventies, yeah. uh, you had to have Latin. Listen, to this is true. Yeah. You had to have Latin in order to go to university. So if you didn't take Latin in high school, you couldn't go to university. It didn't matter if you were studying geometry. Latin was a requirement. Right. So every kid took Latin, or every kid who was going on to be to uh, third level education. You had to take Latin. That was about Look at Oxford, uh, Oxbridge. Uh, I'd have Latin, to. I'd yeah. have to check the year but I bet that that was it was changed while I was in high school so I bet that that was changed in like 1973 or something they did away with the Latin requirement it might have been 72 73 74 that was the year that you no longer had to do Latin so again most people still did it but that was a requirement now of course it worked great for people doing biology people doing medicine but you it, know it, but if you wanted to be a writer too uh, it's like a keys to the kingdom, Latin, right, right. and how to build language, how to build yes. sentences, understanding structure, and, and then Greek and, too. Because yes. the different, because you can use uh, English is amazing in that you can use so many different words because you have the uh, French influence, you've got the Germanic influence, right. Frisian, whatever you want to call it. But then you can go to Greek and Latin where it's the micturate rather than urinate, and then you right. can go to just plain old pi. Double S, right, right, <laughs> something right, right. like that, with its the vernacular. Sibilance. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was always challenged by which Greek. And we never, somebody like Joyce would, come, you know, oh like God. an organ. He'd yeah, go through yeah, everything. Yeah. Well, then it's the meaning. And so what happens is that when somebody says a word, it isn't just a word. It's all that connected meaning. So there could be a de- there's a oh, deeper level of conversation because the word carries more than just the individual. You know, when somebody says to you of a local politician here, uh, that person's a real Julian Sorrell. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's Stendhal, the black right. and the white, and you know what it means. But that person was, uh, told me this was almost like in his 70s, and I had the real, oh, you know, it took me a while to dredge that right, back right, up. Because right, right. I, you know, it was so, I had read it in my 20s, because you had to read. Uh, there was, an, uh, the, the, there was a, another, uh, you know, we all have our, uh, you know, favorites or teachers who influenced us particularly. But uh, I had this uh, brother, uh, presentation brother, <coughs> who, uh, and actually, a very, an amazing man, but for a story for another day. But he was a Shakespearean scholar. And Which is we're all going to get into, uh, and, you know. And he would walk around, and he used, he just he could converse using using Shakespeare. Yeah. I mean, every 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 word out of his mouth was a lot. You know, when I speak, let no dog bark. You know, he he would just like instead of just saying be quiet. You know, he anyway. So. Um, oh, John Sober, who was the president of BU, used to do that. But then he would get the things wrong. Which or that, so you're 20 years old. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. let's you know, see if you got the guts to call him out. You know on who that. surprised me. In that regard was uh, was Bulger, the, who was a pre, you know Billy Bulger. Oh yeah, Billy Bulger. That was part of his affectation. Um, but the, the, not the, Whitey. Uh, Whitey the, Bulger's brother. Whitey Bulger's well, brother, who yeah. wrote the book. He wrote his about his time. But when I read his biography, um, you know, I, I took him as a typical Paul. And I don't know much about him, you know, right. really, whether, how, you know, whether, how, whether he was corrupt or not, whether he was good or not. He ended up being the, was it the... Uh, he was corrupt. Boston and, University, uh, was it, or BC, was it BU? No, the whole U- UMass. UMass, yeah. So, I, I don't know, but but I was just, I remember reading his biography, which I don't didn't pay an awful lot of attention to, other than the fact that he was an educated man. And, right, uh, but it was affectation with him in a bit, because, but he's trying to prove when you come out of Southie that, you know, he is educated. Right. Well, he went to Boston Latin, right? Uh, didn't he? Right, which is an excellent school. Yeah, Cambridge yeah. Latin is an excellent school yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But, so anyway, uh, so we were going to talk. Uh, we're, we're going to talk. talk. Albert Finney died, Albert Finney. and uh, Paul, if uh, if uh, we have a few things that we can do, I think B is the background. Ward thirteen goes to the movies, but we also got the video. What uh, what uh, if you got a chance? Well, uh, see the video D. Video D. Which one is that? We'll have a look and Tom. see. You out there, uh, Paul? Oh, here we go. We are all of us as God made us. And many of us, much worse. Tom Jones was much, much, much worse. The whole world loves Tom Jones.
Keep talk. Keep talking. We'll see what happens. That's your video. Yeah. It died just like that. It's still playing. How come it's stuck? I don't know. Hey, let's try that. We'll try N. We have a backup Tom Jones video. Yeah, I guess they've got to be loaded up properly. Uh, Which number do you want me to play? N. N for Manny. What? What one? All the way down there. N. N. N? Okay. Yeah, for uh, Nancy France. No, no, no. No, no, William. Yeah. Um, so Albert Finney, you know, most people, I think... Can, you, can they hear us, Paul? Yeah, you're talking. Okay, uh, Albert I'm Finney. Gonna, see, I'm going to come back to you on screen. There's some kind of issue with Yeah, there's video. a glitch. Albert Finney was, you know, who just recently Rick died. Had to die this week. What's the role that he turned down that made your a fellow uh, uh, Irish, uh, fellow countryman yeah, famous? Yes, Peter O'Toole in uh, in the Desert Fox, or not no. the Desert Fox, uh, um, um, in uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. David yeah, yeah. Lean. Yeah. They originally were going to sign him. They did a hundred thousand pounds worth of uh, tests and color in that, and uh, David Lean. Uh, Finney later said, years later, said he was a very cold director, and uh, Lean thought he was too young. He didn't have the experience, right, right. but he, he was more physically alike, like, uh, uh, you know, Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, T. E. Lawrence yeah, T. and T.E. Lawrence's right. brother, who owned the rights to, and sold them, right. and had some power over it, because Brando was the original choice, because right. it, was, it was Sam Spiegel who uh, produced On the Waterfront, which won him his first Best Picture Oscar with Ely Kazan, and Brando won the Oscar, and he loved Martin Brando, and he wanted Brando for the role. But Brando said, I'm not going to ride around on a camel for two years, and he ha there's an F-bomb in there, too. Yeah. So then he makes Mutiny and the Bounty for two years, which ruins his career, but that's... Right. You know, he had a great time. Oh, they're so, all great movies, though, right? Albert Finney, they said, here's a five-year contract, and he just walked out on it. But they... And so the last choice of all was the best choice yeah, Peter because he, he might not be the Lawrence of Arabia because Lawrence of Arabia was about my height, about five foot four. Right, and, right. And, you know, Peter O'Toole was six two, but he was born to play that Lawrence. And, and, and the, if you, brilliant if, if you role. And the movie's a great movie, you know, oh, because it's, it's a, I would say it's one of the, one of the arguably greatest, the greatest right. movie. You could argue that's the greatest movie. And when you think movie, about all this stuff I mean, was done without... Uh, without Spielberg uh, loves without, it. Yeah. You know, it was done without... Uh, it's all computer, practical. Yes. But the, the actual cinematography, it's all, it, there's no oh, computer animation, and all, all those extras and everything. I mean, it's there, those desert scenes and the battle scenes and everything. It took it's, a year and a half to film that yeah. in Jordan and places. But they, and they had to pretend Sam Spiegel wasn't Jewish. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't allow him in Jordan uh, if they were. I mean, it, it, you know, it's a little. I guess if one looks at it from the uh, from the viewpoint of sort of a, 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 an Arab person today, it's a little, uh, you know, it's a little tainted that way. But the story of T. E. Lawrence himself. Is well, a that's another. Story. That's we, a different we, we, story. You can come on and talk about that. The point was, uh, Albert Finney right. turned that role down, but right. he made Saturday night and uh, uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning, which is one of the. That's. Video is all set if you want to go back to it. Okay, okay. no, we'll go to that one in a second. I, uh, how about, uh, can we get, if you can get picture F up. It's Saturday okay. night and Sunday morning. We have Arthur Seaton, which is one of the great books. I read that when I was a kid. Right. But it's working class literature. Suddenly, in the wake of John Osborne wrote the great play, Look right. Back in Anger, Anger, which they made a movie. Cubby Brock, no, it's what, it's uh, Saltzman, the James Bond. There he is as a Seaton. Wow. You know, he was a handsome guy, character. wasn't he, back in the day? You can see that he just looks like a bloke look to, to me. But just like an average guy, that's what I mean. Like, oh, yeah. Like, like, yeah. But he was from uh, uh, near Manchester, Salford, which... But he's, Salford, he, you, England. You can't yeah, talk yeah. to him as a Mancunian. Though. Right, right. And his father was a bookmaker. But he was the, one of the first working class... He's the first working class star. And then mm -hmm. he was followed by Alan Bates and Tom Courtney. Who I, I saw Tom Courtney on stage. Which really? That guy's a... Right. When was this? Like, how long ago was that? This is like 1950s, right? 1960s? Like, how, how long ago was that? Where well, was Albert Finney started out, uh, he was born 36. He went to RADA, the Royal Academy yeah. of Dramatic Art. Yeah. And Charles Lawton discovered him. 
and he well, understudied it? Lawrence Olivier in Coriolanus, the 1959 version that's very famous, where Olivier was always – Olivier saw uh, uh, Jack Barrymore as a kid right. you know, leaping around yep. his Hamlet, and that's how he created his Hamlet. And so for Coriolanus, as he's being killed at the end, he wanted to be like Mussolini. Because he, when he play, when Olivier played Coriolanus in 1938, it was like, oh, he's the nobleman against the mass. And right. then after everybody goes to World War II, he's a fascist. Yes, right. So he wanted him to die like Mussolini, upside down. So he, Olivier, as he's dying, would fall all off this, you know, they had a construction on the stage. And he'd right. fall down, and they'd have to grab him. <laughs> one, one night, they, they, he breaks his ankle, and, and Albert Finney... Uh, fills in and becomes a star on the stage. Right. And uh, he was the first actor, that great revolution of working class actors, right. because when John Osborne wrote uh, Look Back in, uh, Anger, in Anger, it's a famous story because it was so controversial, that's about 55 or 56. Miller, Arthur Miller was in England, and he liked Lawrence Olivier because they were making that movie uh, with Marilyn Monroe. I uh, can't remember what it's called. Oh, no, the, prince and the, pr the, the Prince and the Prince and the Showgirl, right? Okay. I, I don't which know was Terence one. Radigan, yeah. which is upper, you know, toff, a toffy right. nose, you know, upper class stuff, a comedy. But uh, Olivier didn't like the play, but Miller went with him. He said, "Well, this is great." And Olivier's genius was that he was able to adapt. And then he went to Osborne, and Osborne wrote The Entertainer for him, which is one of the greatest the roles, roles he's right. on stage. And he also yeah. got an Oscar nomination of a broke-down, third-rate comedian, you know, a musical comedian, right. which is right. a, a thing. But uh, So Osborne, the introduction of the working-class consciousness onto the stage, mm -hmm. which... Olivier shepherded that, just like with the National Theater, he shepherded a, a whole new generation of actors like uh, Anthony Hopkins. And, oh, uh, really? Glenda Jackson. Wow. Uh, Redgrave, Vanessa Redgrave. And, uh, oh, yeah, the I, National I, you Theater. You know, and I, I, hadn't, I, yeah, I didn't know Derek that. Derek Jacobi, all of them. But I think about, you know, I, I, was reading, um, I was reading something on, um, on uh, George Bernard Shaw the other day and in Pygmalion and of course the connection with uh, Albert Finney is of course he Albert Finney played in My Fair Lady no he didn't yes he did you think that's uh, Rex Harrison and then later I think well, uh, on stage many years later Rotul did yeah, I'm, almost sir, I'm almost certain no, Albert Finney he didn't no. do My Fair Lady no What's well, right. Rex Harrison was on well, Rick, stage. Well, yeah, Rex, 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 on the movie. Rex well, Harrison's Pimalian's on the movie. Right, 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 yeah. Maybe that it was, was originally. Because I know, but because I, I was making the connection, well, and now the see. connection's broken. We could look that up. I, I'm almost certain. I, I think uh, Peter O'Toole played it. Well, you go at yours. Yeah, I'm good. But I'm the important thing was, this was they were the people called. They were from the north. Right, right. They yeah. were from the north, and all of a sudden you get this injection of a working class culture, right. and the Beatles. Yes. Yeah. Well, you've got the whole like, from for the people, north. For people, know, who aren't, for people who aren't Liverpool. familiar, right? Liverpool, Manchester, those were the shipyards, the working class right. areas, big, like in, right next to Sheffield, the big steel manufacturing places. With the red the, brick universities exa of yeah, the yeah, Victorian. Exactly. But you're not Oxbridge and, with the right accent. And right up until, you know, when you listen to the BBC and the newsreel and all that stuff, they had those sort of very British accents. And of right. course, even I'm saying British accents, but of course, somebody from Manchester, uh, their accent is as genuinely, perhaps more genuinely British than somebody from London is. They're all equally British. Well, if you ever hear the Beatles, like in the early days, talking when they're not putting on the accent, you can barely understand them. Well, you don't know what they're them. saying. Um, Lan Lan that's Lancashire. That's um, where the, uh, my great grandfather's from. Oh, is it? Yeah, Lancashire. Um, I was going to uh, uh, the reason just to go back to the, the reason I was going back to when you you talked about uh, Redgrave and 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 uh, well Vanessa Redgrave and, and all those. I was going to tie in with because because the George I wasn't aware that George Bernard Shaw that is I was going to mention a minute ago was actually one of the founding members of what was originally New Labour now the Labour Party in Britain. Yeah, he was one of the uh, he was one of the first like he was part of the you know the 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 uh, and then his <laughs> right. We're having some trouble with the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society, right. correct. He helped found labor. He did. And I, so I, I had, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I'm just looking up. Um, um, you see, at the time in the 50s, Olivier was considered like the height of an establishment actor, you know, right. hobnob with all, everybody. But he adapted where Gilgood and uh, the other great actor, what's his name? Uh, it was a great friend of Olivier. Uh, 
Ralph Richardson. Yeah. Um, it just, took them years to get into contemporary it says, plays. I just found something here. So the other thing that people will remember, uh, uh, Albert Finney, of course, an American audience, will be Aaron Brockovich. Right, that was his last Oscar the, the, nomination. The, the, so, yeah. so, um, um, but anyway, he's, he's known, uh, he is known for his roles in Sa- Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, uh, Tom which Jones. was a great... They call them kitchen sink dramas. Right, two for the road. And by the way, two some for the of, road's a great. So, movie. Some of those movies were actually banned by the censor in England because they they were too uh, they were too uh, raucous or raunchy. For I mean, they would never oh, be banned yes. here. But you know, or whatever yeah. it was the censor. So, the, so um, yeah. and then Scrooge, nineteen seventy, Annie, The Dresser, Miller's Crossing. I have to go to the next one. The next one is A Man of No Importance. Oh, that's an excellent movie. It plays the Irish uh, yeah. bus. So, uh, I, I actually, I, I was in a play in Manchester. I played a part in The Man of No Importance. Uh, Are you talking about the original years. Wild play or, or this? Uh, this wasn't a play. This was no, a movie. No, this is a movie. But I, I, but the, but the oh, mar- you know, the, A Man of No Importance. Have you seen the movie? It, it, no, I've He's not a seen bus the movie. conductor. Yeah, that I, is a gay... Yeah, yeah, I played the part, and there's a scene in the. There's a, if anybody ever finds this on Facebook, it was on Facebook. There's a scene in the movie. It's a bus conductor who's coming out. He's gay, and he's right. coming out. And there's a scene in the movie. And there's a scene in the play in the '60s. Yeah, yeah where uh, there's there's a scene in the play where the uh, he his, he kind of lets it slip to his some of his buddies. He decides to sort of go out. And uh, and be seen, and he comes out a little bit, and his buddies re- immediately they reject him. And he's a guy in his forties who's been right. dealing with these this crisis his whole life, a rising crisis all his life, and he comes to his own self realization. And he goes anyway. There's a scene in, in on the stage where these these buddies of his they're all drinking in the bar, and he comes out, and they take him outside, and they and kick, beat him. they beat the crap out of him. Yeah. So so you know you, you know in, uh, when you're pl- when you're in, uh, acting right, you get taught how to do fight scenes and all that right. stuff. So so I. I took it all to heart, so I'm one of the guys beating him up. So I, so I like I've got a beer in my hand. I put the beer down, like, and I, I got my shirt that's kind of half torn, and I have a flat cap on, and I'm kicking this guy on the stage, right? And somebody took a photograph of it, you know, the night of the play, and they put it on Facebook. But they didn't put on Facebook. They said like, great, great job last night, Jim, or something, and then. People are like, what the hell were you doing? And I, I was like trying to type as fast as I could. It's a play. It's a play. It's not really me. But anyway, a man of no importance. And the other thing I remember about that play in Manchester was when we did the play in Manchester was all the other actors had to, uh, we had a speech therapist or a speech coach come in to teach them all uh, the, the, Dub- the, the Dublin accent. And of course, I got to sit around for hours. You know, when you're on a play and everybody's learning, I could sit in the side, just laugh at them because, you know, for what, normally it was the other way around. I had to learn whatever. We we're doing something from... Virginia, yeah. and I had to learn that this time. They, 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 they What's funny is I, I had a friend that was in the Birmingham rep, and she's from California, so she's playing Blanche Dubois, and they all the English have to learn how to do uh, the accent, which in New Orleans is basically a variation. It sounds a lot like a Brooklyn accent because they've got their own unique accent. Right. And they said, well, with you, it's it's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, no, a California accent is not a, a, a New Orleans accent. But there, there's a couple funny. of others here, John, that I had uh, that I had forgotten, and they sort of sort of from you know there was uh, the the the, the, the Born movies. Uh, these he the was Born in the Born movies. Yeah, he was. He was one of the guy. He was one of the corrupt guys who was. Uh, who was, well, I don't uh, watch stuff very, like yeah, that. Yeah, but they, but people, you know, people watching will remember it. So he was in the Bourne Ult- uh, Ultimatum, and he was in the Bourne Legacy, and and but he, I don't remember this, but he was in Skyfall. Yeah, at, he's at the, the very end. That was his he, last movie role. What 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 does he do in Skyfall? Where he says he's the he's the uh, groundskeeper at the uh, family uh, man. Is that him? Yeah, it's just a cameo. Yeah, you, he, that's because. Like uh, Harry Saltzman and that, he knew all those people. He probably knew Cubby Broccoli's family, who, who you know. So it, he was he was nominated for the Academy Award for best actor. F- it says here four, but it could, this is only uh, five Wikipedia. best actor. So it says Tom Jones, Murder on the Orient Express. Right, I'd forgotten that. Which is uh, much yeah. Yeah, the dresser, the dresser. I don't know the dresser. You've never and, seen the dresser? No. Well, that's with Tom Courtney, too. And Under the Volcano, 1984. He yeah. was also nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Yeah, so Best Aaron Actor Brockovich. For, uh, for Aaron Brockovich. His performance as Winston Churchill in the HBO BBC. Won the Emmy. Player, The Academy saw, saw him receive numerous accolades. Wow, wow. Well, the point is he... Uh just another one of the greats, right? You think back to, I think back to, you know, all, you talk about Gilgood and all those guys, like from the British side, um, and Peter O'Toole and uh, Richard Harris, and like all those, uh, uh, they're all gone. You well, know? I, I want to show, I'd like to do this sport. Uh, so he turned on the role, 
well, could have made him a, a superstar. So right. he, but he had, made Peter O'Toole a superstar. What right. else did Peter O'Toole do? That was probably the, you know. But he's most he didn't even for. care because he was asked about it years later. He didn't care. Yeah. Uh, he didn't want to have a five-year contract. But uh, Tom Jones was yeah. 1963. It was uh, Osborne's company, John Osborne, Woodfall. But it was with, uh, who was that director? He won the Oz, Tony Richardson. Uh, you don't know film as well as I'm, fi- I'm realizing you don't know film and theater as well. No, Tony yeah. Richardson won the Oscar. That was a revolutionary film for its time because they used helicopter shots. They're taking a, a cla- you know a classic Tom Tom Jones by right, yeah. by Fielding. Yeah, and uh, they're not giving it a uh, you know an MGM or a uh, Alexander Corder type of treatment. Because it is a comedy, right. they're they're almost you know it's almost like by by a Charlie Chaplin and everything, right. but the, skit, the, the yeah. jump cuts and and all sorts of stuff. And it won Best Picture Oscar. It was the first British picture to be honored like that. If you don't consider something like because Lawrence of Arabia was yeah, you know, that's yeah, Sam yeah. Spiegel, that's right, U.S. Right, money, right. and uh, Tony Richardson won the Oscar too. Can we try and no, this is the most famous scene from it at the time. Right. Okay, let's if you're there, Paul, we'll try and again. Hold on one second. Okay, but uh, but people don't understand. This was all revolutionary. The okay. introduction of these actors, not yes, just in yes. England, but right. then when they hit the United States okay. too. Okay. Heroes, whatever high ideals we may have of them, are mortal, not divine. We are all, as God made us, and many of us, much worse. Mm-hmm. Oh, we were, we were talking, uh, we thought we were talking over this, but... Uh, well, let's finish what we're saying. This was considered very risque at the oh, time. Yes. Yeah. It was a very famous scene, very naughty. And you were saying in places like England and Ireland, it was banned. a lot of these it films banned, were banned. Yeah, banned by the censor, yeah, because it was too raucous. 
Well, a sat. It's is it Saturday night and Sunday morning? morning. He gets he gets the uh, his mistress, yes. who's a married woman, pregnant, and they talk about abortion or something, right. which that was yeah, so yeah, controversial. Yeah, yeah. So they could they wouldn't. Uh, they, they was w- it was amazing, uh, you know. And and it all went back to Ireland as well. You know, the censorship in Ireland was 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 would have been was much worse. Much than worse England. because it what's amazing to me is the great the great Irish writers. You know, people like uh, James Joyce. You know, so yeah. you know, ba- Dubliners. You know, banned. You know, they, oh, they, yeah. they, like uh, well, uh, Ulysses was banned in 1933 yeah, yeah. in the United so, States. So they, uh, yes, oh, I'd forgotten that. You know, right. life has changed so much, right? But uh, he uh, on stage, uh, he was Billy Liar, which was a great working Northern film, right. which was Tom Courtney and Julie Christie made the breakthrough. Oh. They, you know, he was offered all these movies, but he just. <laughs> He there's didn't a, have much ambition. There's a list here on uh, Wikipedia of his... Because he won an Oscar nomination. He, it was a big star, and then he just virtually walked away from it. Um, there's a list here of his theater credits, right? So starting in 1956, Henry V, when, which, of course, he played the title part. Um, and then oh, the, everybody, Henry V. Oh, yeah. the, the, the Party, 1958, and then uh, Coriolanus... In 1959. Right. That's what made him a name on stage. We took over from Olivia. Right. And then he did Luther twice in 61 and 63. He did Luther in London and in, on Broadway. And he was on the cover of Newsweek in 1963. He was, you know, poised for like superstardom. And he just walked, really basically walked away well, from at it. At the Lunt Fontaine Theater, right. He and said then, he liked to drink, eat, and make love to all the beautiful women he oh, made. What's wrong with that? And right? he'd have to go yeah. to the fat farm to slim down before a movie. <laughs> Uh, then in 1965, he did Black Comedy and Much Do About Nothing. He did Don Pedro in uh, Boat at the Old Vic in Much Do About Nothing. In 1965 to 66, he did Miss Julie. Well, he made a, he did a lot of plays afterwards. And right. You could have, but the point, the interesting thing was uh, Luther. I don't know if he won the Tony Award. Was famous. But he turned on the movie when they eventually made it years later. And he fell out with John Osborne. And he also, Lindsay Anderson, he was close to, uh, was a great director. He turned on The Sporting Life, which made Richard Harris right. star, which is a great another, movie. I was going to have some Irish clips from guy. that. An- another Irish guy. Right? And, uh, but interestingly, in the 70s, he played Hamlet and was a disaster. And was so he? was Peter O'Toole. Peter yeah. O'Toole opened the National Theater... When it became the National Theater, the old Vic became the National Theater in 64. Right. And Lawrence Olivier directed it. It was not the greatest sta- P- stage. Peter O'Toole was so... And he was... He was very... Uh, he could be very self-absorbed. You know, he, he was... Uh, especially later in his career, you know, um, I, I, I saw him being interviewed a number of times. And, you know, when he got much older, he kind of mellowed again. But there was right. a time when he was, you know, uh, we might have said too big for his boots almost. But he certainly... It was about him, you know. He was... Uh, well, when you're an actor like that, and you're so uh, singular. You think about all actors, like even Brando. And, you know, uh, 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 Rod Steiger was a great character actor. But right. suddenly you reach, like, the top. They're giving you an Oscar. Right. And you're in your early 40s. And suddenly you start repeating yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the best things, Brando just goes off screen, you know? Right. You just repeat yourself. But some people are able to reinvent themselves yeah. later. Like, Clint Eastwood became a much better actor when he was, like, 70 yes. years yeah, old. Yeah. He wasn't much of an actor. Right. But... Some actors, you ju- George C. Scott, great character actor and actor, right. and then you just start repeating yourself. And ironically, uh, Peter O'Toole also bombed the Macbeth, and so did Albert Finney. His Hamlet, they did well, no, they're, and his they're Macbeth. similar in a way. Yeah. I mean, they both. I mean, I I, I remember seeing uh, Peter O'Toole on stage, uh, drunk as a skunk. I mean, just uh, out of his mind. Oh yeah, Albert uh, liked to yeah, drink and, too. Uh, and uh, in the end, he had to be hauled off. Like they do, they were playing music to get him, and he was gone off script and rambling. And well, that's what way. they say. It's funny. That's what they say. But Albert Finney, he's playing Hamlet and Macbeth and Macbeth, and suddenly he's making jokes and throwing everybody off. Yeah. They say that Burton had a problem where he'd get bored. Yeah. You know, he'd get bored playing it every night. Because right. he was, a, he really made a big mark as Hamlet in 64. Yeah, Richard Burton, right, But, right. Uh, you know, uh, but interestingly, uh, he was a great Tamerlane, which is very rarely, rarely played, uh, right. the Marlowe play. Yeah, which I yeah. often think of that line about the earthly crown when I think yeah. about our. We don't see, president. you know, like, we, like I, I, I'm. But these we, guys were classically trained. Right, right. Classically trained in Shakespeare and like, all that. And I wonder where are those people today. I mean, there must be people out there doing it. We just don't. But who don't. is the great Hamlet of the of the, the of this generation? I, I I don't know. Nicole Williamson. Really? Oh, uh, when uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Wilson. 
was invited to the White House with Nixon. He was raving. Tony Richardson directed him at the Round House, which was this small theater. And Nicole Williamson was like the Hamlet of that generation. So they had him come and entertain Nixon. Wow. And uh, but that guy, talk about a drunk. That was a guy with that phenomenal talent, and just yeah. he'd yeah. he'd come out of character and kick somebody like right. behind well, if he didn't drink. like you. I was down. Um, I, He's I, gone now too. I was down for the first time in many years. I was down at Coolidge Corner Theater. Oh, uh, I used a few to like, ago. So Henry V with Olivier, and, there, uh, and that's where movies. sort of so you go to a place like that and you discover. I mean, it's this is more a comment on my shelteredness and sort of being busy, you know, with domesticity and kids and sort of you know taking kids to baseball games or football games for for lots of years, um, and uh, and the world of uh, uh, the world of theater and uh, etc. You know, it goes on. It's yeah. just that it's I'm the one who's left it, not it. It has left us, if you know what I mean. Right. Because when I was down at Coolidge Corner the other day, a few months ago now, and like I'm like, the, the, this world still exists. You know, there are still people going to great movies and interested in great movies, and it's not just all. You but know. it's a different style of acting. It's bravura. You yes, know, yeah, where yeah. there uh, you can almost feel, hear the spittle. Nowadays, uh, since about the year 2000, they have microphones that are so sensitive. They don't want you speaking up. Right. They want you to speak uh, in a, a almost. A, you know, a small voice, because they can pick it up. But, you know, movie acting and, and theater acting are different. But then by the year 2000, I remember going to uh, the Olivier, which is the National Theater, which is a horrible place, all concrete with a mm-hmm. hiss and everything. It's so cavernous, they had to finally, even in England, yeah. take microphone Phones. and microphone so they could get... Yeah, people could hear, and it's much, and so because someone like you talk about Barrymore earlier on, but even like Gilgood and people like that, you know, they were Christopher they're, Plummer they're, was they're, a great actor. Yeah, their on voice, stage. they were sort of this avuncular sort of, you know, uh, rich, uh, plummy. Rich, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd hear it like he like was, someone like uh, someone like what's his name, uh, 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 Hopkins. You know, what's his? Oh, uh, uh, you yeah, know, Anthony still, Hopkins. Anthony is a great Hop- actor. still has it today. You know, it's sort of they can project that voice, so you can tell their stage. Cra- they're, 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 they're stage oh, yeah. actors, right? That's the thing you'd learn, cla- you know, how to right. project from your diaphragm. Right. And it, so you use very little power, but right. you, you, you learn how to use your lung the, and right, you can right. play. But that's what the William Waller, the great film director, told Olivier when he was uh, Wuthering Heights. Says, this isn't, uh, you know, I'm not in the third balcony, uh, the opera in Manchester. Yeah. You know, I'm right, right here. Right, 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 right yeah. <laughs> Dial so, it down, dial it down. But then you have to admire people like Gilgood who were able to, like all that subtlety and you know, soft voice stuff that they were able to do for movies afterwards, oh, they which they never would have done on the stage, right? Who You would never have whispered on well, the stage. Well, Gilgood was not a great stage. The, only, the best f- first performance is when he plays uh, uh, the king and uh, Chimes at Midnight, right. Wells, where he's uh, Henry the uh, Fourth, right. And he's very subtle because he's being directed by a great, not right. only a great actor, but a great right. filmmaker too. Right. Right. But he later developed when he was older because he didn't care yeah. about the right. he didn't care about film. Where Olivier did and didn't. But see, what, that's a different era too. Right. What about Brando? Was, excuse my ignorance, but was Brando ever like? Uh, did he was he ever on stage? Brando was. Oh yeah, he was. A gr- he was great stage actor. Was he? They say uh, from people that I know, uh, Brando and and uh, Burton, you couldn't keep their eyes off him. Uh, Ilya Kazan had the problem when he was a uh, truck line cafe, uh, Maxwell Anderson. Even when he was just a, a supporting character, but he played a very key role. He murders his wife, and he has right. to come in at the beginning of Act Two. And they say, you know, everybody's eyes are on him, so you have to block. So he's there with the main characters speaking. And that was the problem with Richard Burton, too. They had to, uh, when they did Camelot, that you couldn't just keep him. He have to be there even when he's not speaking because right. everybody watches him. And I know somebody that saw him, both Brando and Burton, where they just command the stage. Yeah, yeah. And there's very few actors like that, but he hated acting. He, he always said they wanted to give him an Oscar back in... This geez. is Burton, you mean? No, uh, well, B- Burton didn't like acting yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. It was just he could he got rich so quickly after right. the war because right. he had a beautiful voice and he was handsome. And right. John Gilgood, you know, brought him into his company and he was an overnight success. And he had that voice. Too. But they didn't he, they didn't respect the acting, yeah, and neither yeah. did uh, Brando. When they were right. going to give him an Oscar, what, his good friend who was in Truck Line C- uh, Cafe, Carl uh, uh, Malden, was the head of the oh, Academy. Carl he says, Malden. we'd like to give you an honorary Oscar. He says, do I have to be there? He said, no. uh, yeah, I said, forget it. Yeah. And there's the other famous story where they wanted uh, to make him a Lear on Broadway. Once, it, 
this could be a, Brando's a whole subject into itself because right, right. they always thought he was going to become the American Olivier, yeah. and you know he had no interest in going on stage af, after. It's it's grueling. It's grueling. Yeah, yeah, yeah And yeah. Uh, they asked him in the eight, early eighties when Ilya Kazan. You know, always they were trying to get him and Ilya Kazan back together because he was the great stage director of his time, and. Uh, no, they'd offer him all the right. money to go on right. Broadway to play Lear. And he said, Georgie, they took his best friend. He said, Georgie, you know I only went to acting school to get laid. Which, <laughs> so he had no way. You know, they'd already done it all. I remember him and, uh, and uh, uh, what's her name? Um, um, oh, his wife. Uh, 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 which uh, one? Oh, <laughs> when he got married twice. Liz, um, oh, oh. You, well, now we're back to Burton. Yeah, sorry, we were at Brando. Burton. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I remember uh, him in um, Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, that's uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Franco Zeffirelli, really? and then and then of course, and then the classic Cleopatra with. Uh, you looked but, like he was drunk. But, but, yeah, Scott. at that point, it was really just about the two of them. He couldn't act on film because he started in '52. He got an Oscar nomination and My Cousin Rachel. Then '53, a Best Actor in the Robe, but it's just because of the publicity machine. He couldn't become a star because the camera just didn't like him. But he said that Liz taught him how to act on film. So there's that brief period where if you see uh, Night of the Iguana, he's brilliant. And uh, uh, the spy who came in from the, the cold, cold, it's brilliant. And yeah. then, you know, who's afraid of the Virginia, Virginia Wolf? Wolf right. But they'd always shoot him. He was always letter perfect. He'd always do just one take, and, you know, right. rather than somebody like Brando would do 40 takes right. to really get get into it but, but there's also there's some commonality and he lost it again he yeah. just didn't care is it just because they were British but there because there's this commonality between him like and and uh, this, this sort of Peter O'Toole and Albert Finney and Richard Harris well, and all these guys there's some connection there's some tread there right because they're not they're not of the oh, yeah. Bogart and, and sort of uh, you know oh, yeah, the yeah. American tradition right I mean but although they loved more... Bogart uh, Richard Burton was one, his great friend in Hollywood in the early 50s was, was, was Bogey you know you got to realize all those British stars like Har you know, well, Harris didn't like Brando because they right. were almost contemporaries and they were right. in a movie together and he treated them like crap. But all the actors of like uh, of the th of like uh, Redgrave's uh, generation and the uh, Fanny, they all loved Brando. Thought he was a great actor. But Brando but was, was supposed actor. to become the Laurence Olivier and lead the American stage, which has always felt inferior because they import right. yeah, yes, the yes. Englishmen. They did then anyway. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. supposed to go to London to see Art with Albert Finney, you know, the play Art yeah, yeah. and Tom Courtney, but they said, oh, he's coming over to Broadway, so I'd wait. And then I was told by somebody, oh, oh, no, they're going to have Ad uh, Alan Alder in it. So, oh, oh, Alan Alder, oh, there's uh, another name. The, yeah, yeah, but he's much more recent. But idea, the but. union wouldn't let them come over. But then uh, Lawrence Olivier actually wanted Albert Finney to take over the National Theater, but he didn't want to. You know, right. nobody would become the, what Olivier was, keeping the British theater alive right. and recommitting it. Because he, Olivier gave up all sorts of money just to run that right. company. People didn't want to do it. They didn't have the commitment or... You I wonder who's like you weren't a, driven. You like who, who's driven the we, who's in the like West that. End today? Because all these people, I mean, I mean, London is a mecca for you know, the state. You know, there are people. You know, you like you get out to Broadway in New York. You go to the West End in London, and you know, it's. I used to it, go. But, but who, I used to go a lot when I used to go to England. Yeah, but yeah. but who's there today? So that, you know, like there. It, it, I don't know it, the new generation of actors. I, are, I don't. It's almost like, are there any? You know, I'm sure there are. I mean, it's my ignorance, maybe, but like, I wonder where the replacements for a Gilgood or a Burton or a or an O'Toole or anybody else. Like, where, where's the? It's probably passe. Those people created a new type of acting in England, and right. it actually affected but America. Who, who inherited too. like Jeremy Irons or somebody like who? Who? You I know, don't know. Hugh Grant is that who? Is that who we're left with? Anthony Hopkins is a great stage yes, actor Hopkins, and Anthony a great Hopkins. film actor, but he yeah, yeah. spends time in America and you know right. he's finished anyway, pretty much. Right, now, he's right? like eighty years old. Right, now. right. And yeah. uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. I wonder. Uh, my my son is at uh, UNH. He's actually uh, he took um, he took film. He's doing something of it, but he just as an additional course, he took film last year, and so, which is why I ended up he and I going down to the Coolidge Theater and places like that, and sort of we're talking the Seventh Summer. Bring him on. Stuff we should. We'll have. Uh, we will tackle this in uh, like a two or three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Are we uh, going to finish with our poem? We're going to do. Uh, we're we're going to take a take a breath. Take a breath. Breathe in. Oh, the second. Do we have coming. him. We'll, we'll just have him on camera, Paul. All right. Dolly B. Yates, the second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. 
Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming? Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow ties, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. W.B. Yeats. Yeah. Good Irish poetry. Happy birthday, Sergeant Rick Fury. And we'll see you next uh, week. Thank you, John. Here at Ward 13. And thank you, Jim O'Connell. Thank you very much. Good night. Wonderful. as God made us, and many of us, much worse. Tom Jones was much, much, much worse. The whole world loves Tom Jones.